May I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is so good to see you. Great to see you. Great to be back with you. We didn't get a real goodbye, and so this is both a, a hello from a different place uh, and a, a kind of goodbye as well. I wondered how it would feel to be here for me, and maybe, maybe uh, you're thinking about that to yourself, how it feels for you. It feels like a long time, uh, but time is different in the pandemic. In some ways, it feels like a short time because I continue to pray for all the people that you have on your prayer list. And in some ways, it feels like a long time because the things that we talked about, the church wardens and I as the corporation, I haven't thought about in nine months. I know you're thinking about them, but I haven't thought about them. So it, it feels different uh, to be here knowing you're thinking about things and, and I'm not in that place anymore. I'm very grateful for the reminders of our time that have come. The cards. Uh, some of you have visited Ottawa and I'm glad to see you whenever you can. Uh, and I've dropped in for all the things I forgot to take with me, so uh, thank you for that. And my heart has been with you as you lost Norbert Lork and Roy Schatz. And I mourn with you. I've also followed very closely how Don, Father Don, came to be here. Tim and then PJ, and then Don. And I think it's for a reason that is common to clergy who tend to stay a long time in places, that we all hope that we'll, we've left things better than we found them, and that the new person will take it further. So I already know from seeing Don on social media that he's energetic, and enthusiastic and full of passion and he's gonna love you. But some things will change because Don is Don and Don will never be Gary and that's how it should be. And some things will change because of outside circumstances. Things that you'll be delving into because the diocese and the bishop have asked you to do them and you're really in a different chapter from my journey with you over the nine years that I was here. So uh, this is a different chapter. Maybe you're wondering how I landed in Ottawa. Some of you are on social media and some of you are not. And so I'll say that despite previous news, I am single and pouring my heart into parish ministry and making it an adventure. But I want to turn the focus onto you in a blunt way, kind but blunt, and I intend to, you know, shoot it down after I say it. Let's just say that I go to Jesus and say, can Don and I be at your left and right hand? You know, I worked hard, he's going to work hard. Can Don and I be at your left hand and your right hand when you're on your throne? If I said that to Jesus, I think there's a case where clergy can fall into the propaganda of their own importance. They think they're carrying the whole load. It's reinforced in non-church management thinking that as goes the leader, so goes the organization. And in some ways that's true, you know, a leader who is distracted or makes inappropriate decisions, it does affect everyone. But when I think about James and John asking Jesus, they weren't clergy. They were actually no different from the rest of the 12 disciples. Or were they? So I'm kind of putting you in the position of, would you be angry 
if I went to Jesus about Don and I? Maybe James and John thought they were doing all the work. There's a strange outworking of what's called the 80-20 rule. I don't know if you've heard of that, where 80% of the people um, kind of stand back while 20% do the work and 20% do all the giving. By that logic, I could have chosen some very different people to go to Jesus to make the special request. Mark, David, and Peter could have gone to Jesus and said, hey, we're working really hard, can we have those seats by your throne? Because you know they've been working really hard for you. Or, Mary Lou and Julie could do it. Go to Jesus and say, let us have those seats by your throne, because you know they work very hard. All the others were working very hard too. In fact, Peter was in more stories than James and John. And I would not say that Judas wasn't a hard worker. He may have had a different vision from the others. If you have watched Jesus Christ Superstar or The Last Temptation of Christ, Judas had a different vision of what needed to happen. But that doesn't mean he wasn't working hard at it. What really stays to me about St. Anne's is how hard all of you have worked at this. How you've applied yourself to becoming the church you need to be. I could have well imagined that you should be angry if anyone thought their, their contribution was more important than yours. Perhaps James and John did misunderstand Jesus, and he asks them about that. Do you understand what you're asking? They're thinking throne, they're thinking political trappings, they're thinking respectability, versus what Jesus prayed, your kingdom come. As in your reality of how the world should be, being how we are. And perhaps there's a second misunderstanding in there too, and that is, is the task for St. Anne's the same as it was for Jesus? Well, it's a variation. At St. Anne's you say, bringing the community together for good. And you mean, gathering the people to be in communion and worship. In the day-to-day, -day, it might feel like that's different from Jesus saying the kingdom. Because I think he must have used kingdom language for them to think of thrones. And when the diocese asks you to sell a building and refurbish another building, that might not feel like the kingdom. But if you step back to the bigger picture, I think it is. You may wonder if when I left St. Anne's to go to St. John's in Ottawa, I found myself with an easier task. Actually, it's the same challenges everywhere. Old buildings, a demographic cliff of wondering who will follow as our eldest parishioners leave us. How to regroup. How to keep a focus on the kingdom Jesus spoke about when we're focused on the nitty-gritty of buildings and property. It might not feel like this is the focus on your kingdom come. But I think it is. I think you're clearing the way to be able to focus more on the kingdom, on the way God seeks for the world to be. For this task of God's kingdom, all of you are needed. 
Not just James and John, not just Peter. Jesus wanted all of the disciples and all of you are needed. Some of you may think of yourselves as kind of standing on the edge. Maybe you're in a busy time in your life and you see leadership roles and you're not ready to have them yet. I remember uh, at the church I was at before St. Anne's, I asked this man, John, if he would be a warden. I had asked the other wardens and they thought this was a good idea and I asked him and he said outright no. And then he called me later that day to say, you know, eventually I'm going to have to take my turn <laughs> and there's never going to be a good time so I need to change my no to a yes. Everybody's needed. And even if you don't all share the same vision or the same priorities, many perspectives are healthy. St. Anne's is a diverse place. And if Father Don asked you, what is your main priority, you probably wouldn't all answer with the same thing. And that's just fine, because for any new person, they could then say, there's room for my perspective too. Next week is Don's induction and mine. The way church goes, uh, I've been doing in-person church for just as long as you have, about a month. And uh, so both of us will be celebrating next Sunday afternoon. But I just said all of you are needed. We call it an induction because we fall into the short form language of a past era. It's actually called a celebration of new ministry because you will be a new configuration of the 12 disciples. That's what you need to be. I will be praying for you from further afield. I will rejoice in how you take things further in whatever direction you need to go to be faithful to God's kingdom here. And I will always be grateful that I got to be here with you. Amen.